page number 89 tonight. Page number 89. Let's all get our psalm books and let's lift our voices up to the Lord tonight. All the way, my Savior leads me. Page number 89 tonight. Page number 89. All the way, my Savior leads me. What have I to ask beside? Page number 411, The Solid Rock. <coughs> Page number 411. My hope is built on nothing less than truth. Let's all stand tonight. We'll open the service in prayer and have a time of greeting one another. So good to see you all out tonight and uh, so thankful for this beautiful day the Lord made for us. Amen. Brother Ralph Pitts, would you lead us in prayer tonight, please, and open our service. Lord, we do thank you again for being in your house tonight, Lord. Just pray, Lord, you be with us, Lord, tonight in this service, Lord, that we give you glory, Lord, and honor, Lord, and praise, Lord. And we look forward to hearing from your word tonight, Lord. Just uh, 
Bless everyone here tonight, Lord. Bless this service, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Turn around and welcome folks to church tonight. Looks to page number 412 tonight. Page number 412. Page number 412 tonight. Page number 412. How can I fear? Page number 412 tonight. Page number 412. When child.
page number 228 tonight, one of our Christmas hymns, What Child Is This? quarter in it we'll get it right page number 228 what child is this what child is was found in the bathroom. Somebody recognizes that. Uh, Mother-daughter bracelet looks like. Well, get... Somebody mentioned me about giving Sunday. I, I guess I just can't believe how fast the year's passing. And we're nearly at Christmas time. And uh, giving Sunday, I think, will be the night. Is it the 19th, I believe? And uh, giving Sunday, when we just come and uh, what you would normally give in the offering, you put in envelopes and cash and you pray about it. And about maybe one person or 20 people, that don't matter, about who God would have you to give that to. And we just, it's called Giving Sunday, and we give anonymously. You don't let people know uh, that you gave to them. You do it in a way where they will not know uh, who gave it. And then, of course, also a lot of people make, cook things and make things and all that kind of stuff. And there's a lot of giving done that way. So I encourage you to be on that. And then that night we'll be having the Christmas program. And so just a lot going on. But I also want to encourage you. Christmas time can be a time when you get too busy. Yeah. You just get too many things going, and first thing you know, you're just all bit buzzed out of shape, and I'm guilty of doing that, and uh, just want to encourage you to take time for you and the Lord, and uh, don't, let, don't let things drive you, okay? Uh, last week, we started on a message preaching. I didn't get to finish it. It's called Sent to Serve the Shepherd, and we're in the book of 1 Timothy, and uh, Paul here is admonishing and teaching Timothy and giving him... <clears throat> Uh, guidance and direction and the Word of God about wh how to behave ourselves in church and a lot of issues and so, so forth. And we've discussed them. And last week, uh, just talking about what is involved, I want you to take your Bibles. Uh, also, we're going to read the first two verses. It said, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the commandment of God our Savior and Lord Jesus Christ, which is our hope, unto Timothy, mine own son in the faith, grace, mercy, and peace from God our Father and Jesus Christ our Lord. 
As I said, there are several issues there here. We're in, we're in the issue of prayer in the ministry. Without prayer, everything else not going to be worth anything. Not going to be like it ought to be. Uh, be powerless, in fact. <clears throat> going to be a lot of other issues. God's going to talk about money. God's going to talk about dress. God's going to talk about uh, preaching and qualification for ministers and for deacons. We're going to talk about deacons. We're going to talk about a lot of issues in the books of First and Second Timothy. But before Paul ever got there, Jesus Christ in Matthew chapter 9, if you'll take your Bibles there, Matthew chapter 9, Jesus gives us several illustrations of what it means to be sent to serve and to be in the ministry. Uh, <clears throat> Brother Sutton and his family with us tonight. And boy, I tell you what, that wasn't encouragement to see them walk in. Amen. I just want to tell you, I love you in the Lord, and it's a joy to see you. It blessed my heart to see you. He is out there filling in at the church where his father-in-law pastored. And uh, pray for him in the ministry there and, and others across the church and those that God will call. And by the way, it's not just called to preach or anything like that. It's just called to serve God in whatever capacity that we can. But Jesus gives us these uh, illustrations. And, of course, one of it there in Matthew chapter 9, <clears throat> with the first thing in Matthew chapter 9, verse 35, he tells us about, it's, the ministry is about souls. And if you ever forget that, you've just forgotten it. I tell you, programs and planning and all the stuff that we can do. And Reggie's, you know, if anybody knows me, it's so let's keep this thing moving. Let's keep this thing moving. And I don't do that <clears throat> because it's just, I don't, I, I just have something about me. I don't like dead services. I don't like dead spots. And I don't mind waiting on God. And I don't mind stopping for God. But I don't like to be in a church service that's just dragging along and 15 minutes to wait till this and that and the other. People's time is precious. It's what their life's made out of. And, I'm, and, and the time that we have with each other here is precious. And we need to make the very best of it we can. But at the same time, we don't want to rush uh, the Holy Spirit either. Now, so he talks about souls first. And we talked about that last week. If you're going to be in the ministry, souls, Jesus came to seek and to save the lost. And if he sends you and I out, it's to seek and to save the lost, to reach people for Jesus Christ. He said there in Matthew chapter 9 and verse 35 through 38, he talked about, he said, uh, <clears throat> If I can get to the, the right one here, uh, 30, yeah, he said in verse number 36, he said he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion, they fainted as, as a shepherd without sheep. He talks about the fact that there, there are, uh, there's a harvest and the fields are white unto harvest in John chapter 4. And we're talking about there, I'm telling you something, this world's got a lot of people in it. There's a few more people in the world than just in Norwood, Missouri. <clears throat> I drive to Springfield and so forth. I can't believe the people that's on the streets, and that's nothing. And, um, uh, you know, Brother uh, Justin called me before church. The guy from Philadelphia just called me a while ago before church and uh, talked about they went to a mall to do some shopping. He said, Reggie went into a store, and the only people person that would wait on us in the store had a look like a black uh, house coat on, uh, looked like, uh, just, he said, de demonic. He said, there's witches running all around that mall where people are shopping. And he said the darkness and the demonic activity there was just amazing. I'm telling you something. A guy like that needs a lot of power of God to be in a place of ministry like that. And so, but there's people out there, and Jesus Christ died for them. And I want to say something to you. I'll just throw this at you. There's two, you're going to look at everything and everybody one or two ways. You're going to look at them humanly, or you're going to look at them heavenly. And I encourage Brother Justin, what we've got to do is look at people heavenly. That person, though he had a black coat on, though he had a... Which kind of haircut, whatever kind. He said, Reggie, I guarantee you, a haircut he had cost 300 bucks. But, but had these black crosses on and all stuff. But there's still people Jesus died for. Yep. There's still people that can be saved by the blood of Jesus Christ. And we've got to look at those people. <clears throat> I'm telling you something. Somebody walks in this church, they got all kinds of tattoos or purple hair, whatever. we still got to look at those people as precious in the eyes. Jesus tasted death for every man. And it wasn't for the grace of God tonight, I'd be in hell and my body would be in a grave. <clears throat> if it wasn't for the grace of God tonight, I'd be in everything, involved in everything you can imagine. And we've got to look at people from a heavenly view, viewpoint. We need to look also at things in our life from a heavenly viewpoint. You can think, well, that's terrible. That's bad. That's a, that's a human viewpoint. But a heavenly viewpoint will see it from a higher perspective. And so we've got to understand that souls are valuable. They're precious in the field. We had to have a vision. That's what this tabernacle thing is about, is getting people to, to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. And we need to have a vision in this church for what we can do and, and, and don't limit God. Amen. Amen. The second thing we said last week was that in the ministry, it's like sheep in the midst of wolves. That's not a pretty sight. You get your guts tore out and your throat cut. Yep. <clears throat> you get in the ministry, you get ready to have your guts ripped up and your throat, spiritually speaking. 
have your, have your life ripped up. Sheep among wood, that is not a pretty sight. I can guarantee you right now, <clears throat> my grandpa, uh, Danny, you might remember more about this than I do, but there was one time when our grandpa had a lot of sheep down there, and dad told me the story, and dogs or woods or something got into the sheep, and they, what, they killed 30-some sheep one night down there in the valley, <clears throat> wiped him out of his flock. You go out west where the wolves are, I want to tell you right now, if you think a wolf's got any compassion on you, you lost your mind. Wolf, wolf doesn't look at a sheep and go, oh, he's cute, isn't that nice? He's so pleasant. He'll rip him up and shake him like a dog getting rat and, and, and laugh about it while he's doing it and lick his blood up. When God says that I send you forth as sheep among wolves, you better believe him. We've got a lot of men surrendering to preach that thinks, oh, that'd be nice. I'd be a pastor of a nice little flock of people, and it'd be a nice life, you know, and and just be really neat. Now, you don't, it's going to be sheep among wolves. I'm telling you something. And so, but uh, we need to endure hardness. And there's going to be a lot of junk. I'm not going to go into that again this week. And then we finished out last week saying that Jesus also said that we need to be as wise as serpents and harmless as doves. What a challenge. Wise as serpents and harmless as doves. We need wisdom. I'll tell you, if anybody needs wisdom, it's somebody in the ministry. The Bible says the servant of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle unto all men. I'll tell you this story. <clears throat> a lady was working here one time at, at, uh, in this church, and there was a guy involved in the church. He was working in the ministry, and I, I, I think he meant well and everything, but he talked and treated this lady in the ministry here, uh, worked in her school. He talked to her very, um, in a way that, mean. And it really, really hurt her. And she was a hard worker, very servant's heart woman. And it crushed her. And she talked to me when she talked to me about it, you know, and she just, she was weeping. And she's ready. The only thing that I would ask, she says that we would put as much emphasis on the servant of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle unto all men as we say we must be born again. Now listen to that. I've never forgotten that. We're hammer, you must be born again, but we don't hammer, you must not strive, be gentle unto people. Yeah. She said, I wish one must was carried as heavily in this church as the other must. A lot of things must in the Bible. And we tell you about working with people. I do not have the wisdom I need. Be wise as serpents, and harmless as doves. Doves don't do any harm. I've never seen a dove fight a crow in my life. They'll just fly off. I don't know this for a fact. I've never dissected a dove, and if I did, I wouldn't know what I was looking at. But they claim it's one of the only birds that doesn't have a gallbladder. No bitterness in it. But the dove's a picture of the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> wise as serpents and harmless as dove. And then I want to pick up the next one in verse 29 of chapter 10. If I can get my scripture right. In Matthew chapter 10 and verse 29 is the next illustration that Jesus gives if you're going to be in the ministry. is sparrows. We've talked about souls. We've talked about serpents. We've talked about these different things and so forth. But he's talking about sparrows. Verse 29 says, Are not two sparrows sold for a farthing? One of them shall not fall to the ground without your father. I was walking across my yard here a while back and just walked across the yard and there's this dead bird and he's already basically almost like half, you know, but the feathers and the form of the body was still there and it's just there in the yard. I don't know where that cat got it or what. I looked at that sparrow and I thought God knew when that sparrow fell. God knows, Reggie, when, what's going on in your life. Have you ever sat down and watched just birds and be quiet and watch what birds will do? When Jesus said he cares for sparrows, it's a great thing. Because if he cares for a sparrow, he cares for you. If he knows when every sparrow falls, he knows what's going on in your life. Let me tell you tonight how the devil lied to you. The devil lied to you and tell you that Jesus doesn't care. He might know about it, but he ain't got time to mess with you. Or it's not that important to God. It is that important to God. If he takes care for the sparrows, how much more will he take care for you and I? And you need to remember that and don't let Satan cheat you out of that. You say, Reggie, what, a sparrow isn't, watch this, a sparrow's not worth much to the world. The world wouldn't give you a dime for all the servants of God there is. They could care less about you wanting to serve the Lord. You don't amount to anything as far as this world goes. The world doesn't put emphasis, oh man, appreciate those people in America that serve God. You ever heard that on the news lately? No. <clears throat> sparrows are insignificant to this world. They're of little value to this world. Who will miss one? Who will attend this death and funeral? Man came home back when Teddy Roosevelt was president from Africa in Mission Field. Got off up here in New York off the boat. Man, there's a big band out there and thousands of people gathered up. 
Ma'am Teddy Roosevelt came off, man, everybody was there and he went through a line greeting, glad he'd been home, out on the hunting trip in Africa and come back. Everybody, so, you know, the world lauded his coming off. Man, his old missionary had been gone for about 15 years and he comes down the plank and there wasn't nobody there to meet him. That's the sparrow. The Old Testament talks about a sparrow on the rooftop. If you're going to be in the ministry, don't get shook because the world does not value your life and your labor. They're not going to. So if you think you get in the ministry is going to make people really, you know, appreciate you, you got another thing coming. You're just a sparrow. But God knows when the sparrow falls. And God feeds the sparrow. He cares about, about you. <clears throat> the hairs upon your head. He said, Lo, I'm with you in the end of the world. The thing, verse that God has used for years now to sustain me is, Fear thou not, for I am with thee. Be thou not dismayed, for I am thy God. I I will strengthen thee, yea, I will help thee, I'll uphold thee with the right hand of my righteousness. Just knowing that God is there, he's with me, take care of me, give me the strength I need. I'm just a sparrow. I ain't nobody special. And nobody is anybody special. Jesus is special, and we're only special in Christ. But if you're going to be in the ministry, just look at yourself as a sparrow. Don't get shook. The world's not going to have big, they're not going to put your funeral on national TV. <clears throat> Just, just we need to understand that. If you're going to be in the ministry, sparrow. And then tonight I want to break in this. In chapter 10, verse 34 through 38, Jesus gives us more things that's involved in the ministry. As Paul was writing to Timothy, he's carrying forth these things. into Verse 34 said, Think not that I'm come to send peace on earth. I came not to send peace, but a sword. Now, sword's a divider. It's an instrument of death. An instrument of division. For I'm come, listen to your Bible, to set a man at variance against his father and the daughter against her mother and the daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law and a man's foes shall be they of his own household. He that loveth father or mother more than me didn't say he shouldn't love him, just said you love him more than me and this is, a, if I were you tonight, I'm telling you right now, you better get this down. You better not ever love anybody more than you love the Lord. You better love your wife. I'll tell you this much. You can't love everybody like you need to love them if you don't love God above them. I'll just tell you. Because it ceases to be love and it's turned into self-gratification. <clears throat> but when you put people, I don't care if it's your wife or your husband or your children, above God and before God, you are headed for a train wreck. I'm talking about not just a little light when you're headed for a big train wreck in your life. <clears throat> God will have no other gods before him and it doesn't matter if it's your children or my children. God does not want me to compromise the truth of his word just to keep my family together. You read your Bible. And by the way, that's in other gospels about that. You're going to be in the ministry, there's going to be a sword come. You're going to be cut off from friends. You're going to be cut off from family. You're going to be cut off from people you love. It's going to hurt. And, you're, and by the way, you're going to have to die to them whether you like it or not. Because if you don't die to them, you'll live in constant pain. There's some things you've got to die to, die daily to. There's, there's some, maybe there might be some things in life you've got to, but there's some people sometimes you'll have to die to. There'll be division personally. The sword will divide your old man from your new man. Amen. Right down the middle. You, when you, somebody gets saved, you've divided them. They now have an old man and a new man. But then there's going to be not just the division personally, but there'll be division with people. As I said, you're going to lose family and friends Jesus said it would happen. You're going to have to die to yourself and die to your life. <clears throat> Hebrew chapter 4 verse 12 says that the word of God divides. And I'm going to tell you right now, <clears throat> the, the world won't mind it too bad as long as you don't really live out the Bible. If you just stay nominal Christian, just kind of be wherever you're at and whoever you're with, kind of adjust to the crowd you're with, they won't bother you too bad. But when you start saying, listen, I can't go with that, and this is, this is, this is I can't be with you on that. They'll start shedding you off. I want you to get that. This is one of the reasons that many people do not surrender and do not fully give themselves to the cause of Christ because they know intuitively it's going to cost them people. It's going to cost them business. It's going to cost them friends. It's going to cost them family. It's going to happen. You can mark it down your day book. I'm telling you, it's going to hurt. It's going to hurt you. It's going to cause you a lot of pain. Not fun. 
And the next thing, and uh, just in chapter 11, verse number 1, Jesus takes his disciples. And what I want to say here, and I'm just going to kind of go through this a little bit, but not get off too much, but there's another thing if God's called you, especially in the ministry, and that is shepherding. God calls every father to shepherd his family. <clears throat> Shepherds lead, they don't drive. Amen. Jesus is the chief shepherd, and I'm just a sorry, low-down under-shepherd. I, I might do a halfway decent job preaching sometimes, but I'm not a very good shepherd. I mean, just... <clears throat> I, if there's a weakness, I, I care. I really do. But I just kind of raised... Oh, boy, said I wasn't raised. I was jerked up. <laughs> I, should, I probably shouldn't say that, but kind of the way I was raised was, you know what, get up and let's go. The milking's got to happen whether you feel good or not. Yeah. Yeah. Did you know that you can't tell the milk cows, I don't feel good this morning, I won't be at the barn. Yeah. <clears throat> I was raised, you go to church, you can be vomiting and head to church 15 minutes later. You okay, let's go. We're back. We need to get to church. Get your vomiting done. Let's go. <laughs> That's kind of the mentality I was raised in. Now, I like people to be compassionate with me, but a shepherd cares about his sheep. And he knows them. And I want to tell you something that bothered me this week. I've been meditating on this mess this week. And this bothers me. Jim, I still can't name all your kids. Good. Hey, girls, I thought about this. What if I stand before God and God says, which land is girls at, Reggie? Uh, Lord, I don't know. How long did you pastor them, Reggie? 30 years. And you don't know their name? I'm sorry, Lord. I know they're one of them. I know they're Landis. You know what Jesus said? I'm the good shepherd. He said, I know them by the name. I never had the Lord do that for me in my life. Brother, jo Brother, Brother Josh, I wouldn't have a clue. All the I just know all you kids start with E something. So I'm just going to go E. But you know what? A Jesus, the shepherd, knows his. How I many glad that God knows you by name tonight? Amen. So what you need to do is take comfort, Lord. My preacher may not know my name, but you do. Amen. Amen. But you know what I thought? Now, if you'd all take pictures of all your kids, put their name below it, I promise you, I'll put my Bible and I'll study on it. I will. But if you don't do that, I'll probably never learn all your kids' names. You, I can't even think. Brett, I don't know why. I remember your name. But I don't, is your last name Maloney? I got that. Amen. That's a miracle. <laughs> but you know what? I don't have a clue of the rest of them kids' name. Your, or your wife's name. Don't have a clue. You ain't been here for 15 years yet. Now, I still wouldn't know it probably. Amen. But sheep, I'm going to tell you about shepherds. Sheep, shepherds care about sheep. They do. And they'll go out and make sure things are okay. And I'm not good at that. I'm just going to be honest with you. You don't show up at church? Now, I might call you and say, hey, how you doing? Been missing you. Everything Okay. But if you act cold to me and like you're done, I'm not going to chase you. Yeah. I'll t I'm going to tell you something. Now, let's, it's like a wise servant's harmless enough. <clears throat> I had a guy and his wife, they, this happened years ago. We was even in the other auditorium. They, they left church. I mean, stomped out on a Sunday night. I'm talking about stomp out, okay? Stomp out. Now, I knew that the situation was bad. So I finally, you know, I, boy, I prayed about it, prayed about it. I didn't, you know, I thought, man, you know, but, I thought, what am I supposed to do, you know? I thought, well, I'll, I'll go see him. And you listen to me. This, this, this where you need your hide of rhinoceros. I knocked on the door. He opened the door and says, well, you finally came. <laughs> like I'm supposed to be some little whip puppy to show up at his door. You finally came, huh? I don't make you very interested in going. I had a couple who went to church here for a long time, and they got it in for me, and they invited Karen and I to dinner. And I mean, they had a big spread out. You ever seen the nicest boy, a beautiful dinner? We ate dinner, thought we was having a great time, got done with dinner, they put everything away. He says, now I want to talk to you. And he laid into me with nobody's what? You talking about fattening the, the lamb for the slaughter. So what's that do to you over the years? 
You get hard. You get, I don't trust nobody. You ask me over dinner, I'm wondering what are you up to? And it hurts you being a shepherd. But I'm just going to tell you right now. Things happen to you and you get out of sorts, I care. But I can't fix you. I found that out a long time ago. I can't fix you. Somebody poisons you against me or other people in church, I can't fix you. Only, Spirit, only the Holy Spirit can fix you. So I, I'm not very good at what I'm preaching, but I'm going to tell you, Jesus is talking about we need to be, you know, as shepherds, we're to feed the flock of God. That's my main concern is just try to feed the flock of God. I'm not up here feeling sorry for myself. I'm just telling you, if you get in the ministry, I, I, and, my, and I'm going to be honest with you, I haven't had anything what other preachers have called and talked to me about. Nothing. I'm one of the, I'm one of the not, I've, been, I've had it easier than probably any preacher I know of. I mean, some of them, what they've had done to them is unbelievably pathetic. And I just kind of mean and honorary. You know, I got, I got a staff in one hand, a club in the other. <laughs> and, you know, but seriously, God calls us to be shepherds and to help people grow in the Lord. Now, I can, I can deworm you if you'll let me. I can pour the wormer on, and I'll feed you if you let me. But I ain't real good. If you're going to go off over and stand on the back side of the field and saw up and plant your feet, I'm not good at dragging you across the field. How many of you ever tried to drag a, drag a sheep or a hog with his feet planted in the ground? Oh, my goodness. Ain't that, I, I, somebody's telling me, was it you? Hey, was it, I got to, where's, where's Justin at? Justin, was it you? I heard about your horse loading episode. <laughs> How long did you try to get that horse loaded? Oh, about 20 minutes. About 20 minutes. Did he ever load? I got you got him. Okay. <laughs> well, I'm going to tell you something. You know, uh, uh, has, has anybody ever tried to load a hog up a, up a loading chute that would, didn't want to go? Yeah. How many has ever put your shoulder to the backside of the hog and pushed him up the loading chute? Sometimes that's like pastoring. You're talking. <laughs> <You're> <laughs> Now, there's a difference between hogs and sheep now. You do understand that, though. <laughs> That's terrible, ain't it? Did you know the Bible talks about lost, lost people as goats and, and hogs and dogs? It talks about saved people as sheep. There's a reason for that. Anyway, I think we better go on, don't you? Say amen right there. Now, go back to Timothy. We talk about all these things, and Jesus deals with this, but in Timothy, Paul is dealing with one big theme about what's involved in the ministry. And in chapter 1 and verse number 18, he said this, that thou by them mightest war a good warfare. Who fights wars? Soldiers fight war. Look, look go to 1 Timothy chapter 6 and verse number 12. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse number 12. Fight the good fight of faith. Go to 2 Timothy chapter 2. I'll just show you how frequently this is. 2 Timothy 2, 3, and 4. Thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. If you want to get in the ministry, endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. I've said this. I'm trying to learn how to endure hardness without becoming hard. No man that warth entangleth himself with the affairs of this life that it may please him hath chosen him to be a soldier. I heard about the, I don't know whether it's true or not, but there's a, one denomination in America that took uh, onward Christian soldiers out of their songbooks, literally. They took, am I a soldier of the cross? Out of the, they said, we don't want to put out anything to act like, I'm going to tell you, we're in a fight, amen? amen? We are in a fight, believe it or not. And God says we are soldiers and we're in a warfare and we're in a fight. Go to 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse number 7. What Paul says at the end of the road, verse number 7, he said this, I have fought a good fight. I have fought a good fight. We are soldiers. If you're going to be in the, I'll tell you right now, just well tell you straight up. You're going to be in this church any length of time. You're going to be involved. You're going to put your heart, your commitment. I mean, in this thing, I'm going to tell you, you're going to be in a warfare. You're going to get fought. The devil's going to fight you. The world's going to fight you. Your own flesh is going to fight you. Right. <clears throat> it going, I'm telling you, it's going to be rough sometimes. The old song says, am I a soldier of the cross? Onward, Christian soldiers, taken out of the songbook, good grief alive. We need, to, we need to realize we are in a warfare. We are soldiers. We are in a fight. Young people, I'm telling you something. We're not walking to heaven on lily pads. We're crawling through foxhole and blood and guts and barbed wire. Amen? Amen? That's the truth. 
And I want to tell you something. Listen, that's the, that, in fact, if you want to understand me, I have a warfare mentality. I'm fighting the devil. I'm fighting the world. I'm fighting my own flesh. That's just a fact. And I'm going to tell you about me. I'm going to be like Truman. If I've got the atomic bomb, I'm using it. Amen. <laughs> I'll drop the bomb. Amen. I've got cannons. I'm going to fire them. I'm telling you right now, and by the way, in Luke chapter 14, Jesus said, if you're going to go to war, you better count the cost first. He said, if you make sure you've got sufficient to finish it. Paul said in 2 Timothy, I have finished my course. I've fought a good fight. I've kept the faith. Henceforth, there's up for me a crown of so forth. You can run and labor and fight, but if you don't finish, it don't count. I've been preaching for right at 40 years now. And I tell you, if I mess up next year, Jeremy, they won't think nothing about the 40 years of preaching. They'll only talk about when I messed up and, and God put me on the shelf and dumped me and got rid of me because I messed up. That's exactly right. Finishing well is my goal right now. I want to finish well. I don't want to come 40 years and in the last two or three or 10 or 15 years mess up and they'll only talk about what race. I'm, I'm going to tell you, there's preachers all of America who ran a good race and then somewhere along the lines, got them like that most of the time is immorality, if you don't just know the truth. That's what happened to David. Now I'm going to tell you, we're in a warfare. Preachers need to understand that. You're going to get up and preach. You get up to preach, the devil's going to, I, mean, I tell you, he'll do everything. He'll do everything right before service or right after or during the service. He'll try to keep you from preaching. Old Charles Finney put out some deal about how to preach without results. And I want to tell you, if you're going to serve God, uh, we need to get this. I want you to listen to this. This is what Charles Finney said. If you want to preach and never see any results, this is how to preach. I love this. Let your supreme motive be to increase your own popularity. Then, of course, your preaching will be suited for that purpose and not to convert souls to Christ. If you want to preach without results, avoid preaching doctrines that are offensive to the carnal mind, lest they should say to you as they did to Christ, this is a hard saying, who can hear it? Make no distinct points and do not disturb the consciences of your hearers, lest they become alarmed about their souls. Avoid all illustrations, repetitions, and emphatic sentences that may compel your people to remember what you say. Average person asking what he preached on last Sunday, they don't have a clue. I don't either. <laughs> Avoid all heat and earnestness in your delivery, lest you make the impression that you really believe what you say. Most Bible colleges are teaching preachers to be polished and intellectual and oratory right now, not have the power of God on them. They, they address their emotions, but not their conscience. That's where we're at in America right now. We're addressing emotions and not their conscience. He said this, if you don't want to be successful preaching, be careful not to testify of your own personal experience of the power of the gospel, lest you should produce the conviction upon your hearers that you have something they need. Do not awaken the uncomfortable memories by reminding your hearers of their past sins. Denounce sin, this I love, denounce sin in general. But make no reference to specific sins of the people in your audience. You want to preach without results? That's how to do it. Do not make the impression that God commands your listeners here and now to obey the truth. Do not let them think you expect them to commit themselves right on the spot to give their hearts to God. Leave the impression that they're expected to go away in their sin and consider the matter at their convenience. Dwell much on their inability to obey and leave the impression they must wait for God to change their natures. Preach salvation by grace, but ignore the con condemned and lost condition of the sinner lest he should understand what you mean by grace and then feel his need of being saved. Preach the gospel as a remedy, but conceal or, ign or ignore the fatal disease of the sinner. Do not speak of the spirituality of God's holy law by which comes the knowledge of sin, lest the sinner should see his lost condition and flee from the wrath to come. Let me tell you, let me tell you where I'm headed. If I had anything I could do, I would want to preach in such a way that when I got done preaching, people would want to flee to the cross of Christ to escape the wrath of Almighty God. That, I, I'm just being honest with you. When we had that kind of preaching, this nation was solid, sound, and blessed of Almighty God. It was a good place to live. Amen. But I'll tell you, nobody has the fear of God anymore. But he said, make, he said make, no, uh, make no appeals to the fears of sinners, but leave the impression they have no reason to fear. Preach Christ as an infinitely aim aimable hippie. Now, he didn't say that, but I did. An, infin an in infinitely aimable and good-natured being, but ignore those scathing rebukes of sinners and hypocrites which so often made his hearers tremble. Admit either obviously or casually that all men have some moral goodness in them unless sinners should understand they need a radical change of heart and from sin to holiness. Say so little about hell from the pulpit that your people will think that you don't even believe in it yourself. 
Make the impression that if God is as good as you are, he surely wouldn't send anybody to hell. Make no disagreeable reference to the teaching of self-denial, cross-bearing, and crucifixion to the world, lest you should convict and convert some of your church members. Do not rebuke the worldly tendencies of the church, lest you should hurt their feelings and finally convert some of them. Do not rebuke extravagance and dress, lest you make an uncomfortable impression on your vain and worldly church members. Encourage lots of church socials and attend them yourself. Make it your great aim to be personally popular with all classes of your hearers. And then aim to make your hearers pleased with themselves and pleased with you. And be especially careful not to wound the feelings of anyone. Especially avoid preaching to those who are present. Preach about sinners out there somewhere, not to those presently. And always say they and not you, lest anyone should take your subject personally, apply it to their own life, and be saved. I want to tell you something. If you're going to preach, you're going to have to take up a sword. You take up a sword and come at somebody with it, they ain't going to like the scene. And I'm just telling you right now, am I a soldier of the cross? We need to ask ourselves. You say, Reggie, what are you talking about? Oh, if you, you want to get along, just don't be like John the Baptist. Don't preach too. Pe Can you imagine John the Baptist looking at Herod and Herod Herodias and saying, it's against the law. You read her and that's against the law. Can you imagine him? I mean, some of you, Bill Clinton come walking in here and Hillary, some of you just nearly wilt down and go, oh, we're so glad to have you. I'll tell you what, if he sat right, I said, Bill, I'll tell you something. You sent more people to hell than anybody I probably know in this nation. You as a leader of this land, I don't hate you. I love you in the Lord. But you, know, you, show, you show no evidence of being saved. I'm going to tell you, I mean, that's what you're talking about. John the Baptist told Herod and Herodias, it's not right if you be married to her. It's against God's law. You're living in sin. You want to be a good preacher in this area? Just be a good, glad handing, shake everybody's hand, slap everybody's back, support the local public school, Baal Temple. Don't fight, don't preach on nothing except other preachers that are. Lay down the sword on sin, dress, education. Make sure you're not tagged as a fanatic and over the top of a nut job and you won't be demonized. You're going to get into ministry? Better get that down. I won't be honest with you. We got enough glad handers and backslappers. We need some preachers in this country. It's the only thing that's going to save this country. I'm going to be honest with you. We need preaching of the word of God. Eighthly, I want to say this to you about preaching. I think there's anything Paul's telling Timothy has some sense. <laughs> sense. Sometimes preachers can be the most senseless people there ever was. Oscar Cunningham told me, and I started preaching, he said, now Reggie, God put just a little bit of gray matter between your ears. Use it. God doesn't have to tell you everything in the Bible that's right to do or the right decision to make. You ought to have enough sense. Walk, you walk close to God, you ought to have enough sense to do what's right in any given situation that comes up. Amen. Even a horse has got sense about where to go. If you get lost in the mountains on a horse, the best thing you can do is turn the reins loose and let him take you out of there. He got more sense than you does. Yeah. You say, Reggie, what are you talking about? Now, I may not be the one that ought to preach this, but I'm going to anyway because it's right whether I'm good at it or not. But we need discretion. We need some discretion. We need some discernment. When to say, what to say, what not to say, how to act and how to be. Not trying to fool nobody, but we need some discretion. A preacher needs a lot of discernment and a lot of discretion about the people that he's dealing with. People, there's every kind of situation going on. And I'll tell you, if you've got enough, but God, you, when I'm telling you, say sense, I'm talking about sensitivity to the Holy Spirit of God, have an eye and an ear tuned to God so that you know what to do in a given situation that comes up. And I mess up on this a lot. I'm telling you, I, I, I'm telling you, there are some things that if I'm not careful, I'll get in the flesh just that fast before I've let the Holy Spirit guide me and direct me about what to say and how to go about saying it. I'm going to give this to you. I heard a preacher say this, and it's one of the most blessed stories that I've heard in a long time. He was preaching a revival at a church. 
They were in about the fourth night of the revival meeting. And he said, I just got started preaching. And he said, in the back, he said, a boy about looked like about 12 years old, come walking in. So he's slim, sloppy looking, and had a hat pulled down, just pulled down nearly over his eyes. He said he sat down in the back seat of the church and just slumped up and folded his arms like that. Hat pulled down. He said, that bothered me. I'm going to tell you something. I don't think you ought to wear a hat in the house of God. That's just me, okay? I, I know the Bible said, thou shalt not wear a hat in the house of God. Okay, I understand that. But there's a little bit about that. But I think there's a deal showing reverence in the house of God, okay? Well, he's one of these old-time old preachers. And, and he said, I was a preacher. And he said, that bothered me. And he kept, I kept wanting, to, said, kept wanting to say something about it. But, but take your hats off in the house of God. And he said, it's like this. The Holy Spirit said, you, you do that and I'll whoop you. Don't you say nothing about his hat. And he said, I preached a little while longer. And he said, I couldn't get my mind off that kid back there. A smart little kid come walking in his hat and folding his arms up, have his hat pulled down over, coming to church like that. And he said, I kept wanting to say something about that hat. And he said, the Holy Spirit kept saying, you say something about that hat, I'll whoop you all over the farm. He said, the third time, he said, boy, I mean, he said, I thought I had me a good zinger. I was going to hit about a hat, wearing a hat in the house of God. And he said, the Holy Spirit said, don't you dare say nothing about that boy's hat. He said, finally, I just said, God bothers me. Ain't right. There's sometimes things go on in church that ain't right. But there's a way in a, to handle things. He said, I closed that message out. And he said, I gave an invitation. I said, is there anybody in this house that's lost and on the road to hell and you'd like to be saved tonight? I'd like to pray for you and give you an invitation. He said, just as quick as I said, they said, that little boy, stringy haired boy, not stringy haired boy, that little stringy body boy, uh, it, hand went up. He said, I gave the invitation. He said, that boy walked up here, never took his hat off. He said, he said I knelt down beside him and he said, I wanted to say, you need to take your hat off. But he said, I didn't say it. I was afraid of God. He said, he would not take that hat off. He did, I didn't say nothing to him, but he wouldn't take it off. He said, that boy prayed, asked God to save him, wept before God. He said, you know, and God saved him. He said, I was getting ready to go. He said, with church dismissed that night, he said, this lady comes up to me after that boy had walked off bare in the back. And she's weeping. And she said, brother, she said, I got to tell you a story. She said, that boy got saved tonight. Now, you listen to me. I'm talking about having some sense. Before I continue, let me tell you, a lot of people have been driven out of churches by preachers didn't have no sense. Or people in the congregation didn't have no sense. That woman said to that preacher, that boy got saved. He's 12 years old. He's my nephew. He came to church. I invited him to church. He told me he was coming. And he, she said, that boy has cancer. He's been treated with chemotherapy. He does, he's shamed of his bald head. He will not take that hat off for nobody. He's ashamed of it, and he said he's deathly sick. What if that preacher would have zinged him about his hat? He said, I'll tell you, it made me want to get down on my floor with my hands and my knees and say, God, thank you for not letting me smart off my mouth. And he said, my, my flesh, wanted, my flesh intending well, kids need to be taught. She said, that boy lives in a trailer house with his mommy. He doesn't even know who his daddy is. I do, but he doesn't. And she said this, I spent the day praying that the preacher wouldn't say anything about his hat tonight when he came. You talk about answered prayer? The Holy Ghost kept that. And that preacher was, at least he was, had sensitive to the Holy Spirit of God. And I'm going to tell you something. I'm going to tell the church something tonight. I don't know what's going on. I don't know what God's doing, but I will tell you there's a stirring in the mulberry trees. I don't know much about, I, I'm not spiritual, but I can tell you, God's wanting to do something here. And I want God to send every drug head. I, I would that God to send every drug head in this country at this church. And if he would, I wonder, would we love them enough? Would we have enough sense to know how to deal with them? To love them in spite of? Wouldn't it be something if God said, I'm going to send them, Reggie, but will you take care of them if I send them to you? Somebody said, sometimes we got our noses so high up in the air, we'd, we'd drown in a heavy rain. Let me tell you something. Jesus died for sinners. 
He died for sinners. And I heard that man tell that story and, and tremble and say how close I come. By the way, get this. That was that boy's first time to church, and it was his last time to church because he died three days later. And he said, I will never get over. He said, if the Holy Spirit's putting the brakes on you, you better listen. If the Holy Spirit's saying do it, you better do it. This week you're going to go out. You're going to see people meet people. And the Holy Spirit's going to prompt you. It may be to say something, and it may be not to say something, and it may be to say something in a, in a certain manner, in a certain way. And I'm telling you, we need wisdom, and we need some sense and some discernment. And I'm not talking about hu human. I'm talking about divine spiritual guidance, being led of and walking in the Holy Spirit of Almighty God. And I'm going to close this whole deal out by saying this tonight, and I mean this with all my heart. And if I was wound up, i am be honest with you, I'm kind of just... I, I don't know what's wrong with me, but I, even before church tonight, I just I didn't feel in the spirit of what I'd like to preach and the way I'd like to preach it, but God knows. If you're going to get in the ministry, I'm going to tell you something, and, and it bothers me to preach this, but I'm going to preach it. You better get filled with the spirit. Amen. Now listen to me, I'm sure most of you who know me very well say, Reggie, why don't you practice what you preach? Being filled with the Spirit's an unusual thing, and it's something I don't think you can really describe. But I want you to know this, that Elisha, when he was with Elijah, and he was being passed on, he asked Elisha something. He said, I want a double portion of your spirit. And Elijah said, you've asked a hard thing. I remember when I started preaching, I said, God, I don't want just a normal deal. I want the supernatural power of God. Lord, would you give me, there's an old song. Lord, what, Danny, help me on that song. Give me, Lord, a double portion of thy spirit, I pray. Now, I'm going to tell you what's needed right now is a double portion. Did you know, watch this. You're talking about answer prayer this morning? Elisha, Elijah, the Bible records eight miracles. Elisha is recorded having done 16 miracles, double. You can go in there and read it and count it. He literally answered the prayer that he asked. He said, Lord, give me a double portion, and God heard it. But he said, Elisha, you ask a hard thing. And he said, if you don't stay with me all the way, it won't happen. And I'm telling you what, he followed him, Beth, Gilgal, right on through the Jordan River, all that, and Elisha wouldn't leave him. And all of a sudden, God's chariot swept down, took old Elijah up. And I'm going to tell you, now you preacher boys get a hold of this one. This one changed my life when I was a young preacher. When he picked up Elijah's mantle, he walked up to the, Jer the Jordan River and he smote the waters and he said this to God, Where is the Lord God of Elijah? You need to ask that. God, if you've called me, God, if you've sent me, where are you? I need your power. I don't have the power, but God, I'm willing, and I picked up the mantle, and I'm willing to serve you, but God, I need power. And I'm going to tell you this tonight. I ain't, I, 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 I'm the sorriest, low-down, worthless, but I'm going to tell you right now, if you're going to serve God, you better get what the old-timers called unction. The Bible has the word unction in it. You say, what's unction? I don't know what it is, but I know what it ain't. Amen. Right. I'm telling you, it's that supernatural power of God. The Holy Ghost comes on, and I'm telling you what, you felt bad, and you felt like you couldn't do it, and you know how worthless you are. But the Holy Ghost of God comes in you and upon you, and he gives you unction, and he gives you compassion and fearlessness and courage and, and care about people dying and going to hell. And for the glory of God, there's an unction, and we need not just unction, but anointing. David said, I shall be anointed with fresh oil. If you're going to serve God, you need unction from the Holy Ghost and empowering to do the work of God. Amen. There's no substitute for it. Amen. You say, Reggie, how do you get that? Well, I, I don't know for sure. But I can tell you what I did. I went out in the woods. I got on my knees. Then I got on my face. I said, God, I can't do what you called me to do unless you do something inside me. I'm telling you, I begged and I pleaded and I wept and I cried. I said, God, I've got to have you. I can't get up there Sunday after Sunday, Sunday night after Sunday night, and I, I can't preach. And I can't, I can't deal with all this, Lord, unless you give me unction and power and anointing. 
Elisha said, give me a double portion. We sing that song, all is vain unless the spirit of the Holy One comes down. And I'm just telling you this. I'm, I'm just going to be flat out honest with you. We don't need any more powerless preachers in America. We got all we can about handle. We need preachers that have the power of God. And they step in that pulpit. You, I'm going to tell, tell you about being filled with the Spirit. I don't make no claims about nothing about that. It's just that I, but I have experienced it. But I'm going to say this to you. You got to get in this book to get filled with the Spirit. This is a spiritual book. It's not so much about being out in the woods as it is being in the book. It takes both of it. You're going to have to have a surrender to God and, and, a, and a crying out to God for the power of God, but it's going to have to, I'm telling you what, you get yourself so full of the Word of God, I'll tell you what, you, I mean, pretty soon you're going to have to do something. You say, well, honey, be still. I'm going to preach at you. Why? I mean, just God get on you. And I'm going to tell you this tonight. If you're going to preach, you better get filled with the Holy Spirit. You say, Reggie, I don't know about that. I'll tell you right now, I don't either. But I just know that's much. If you're, going to, if you're going to serve God, you need the power and unction and anointing of the Holy Spirit of God. There is no substitute for it. And I, I'm just, with all of my heart, get the Spirit of God upon you. Be filled with the Word of God. Be filled with the Spirit of God. Because I'm going to tell you something. We're doing work that humans can't do. You can't save nobody. You can't convict anybody. It's, it, it, everything that is in the ministry it takes supernatural power. It takes the power of Almighty God. Amen. We've got all the psycho, psycho, psychology preachers we need. We've got all the intellectual preachers we need. We've got all the or, orators that we need. We need some people that don't know how, how to say something just exactly right, but they've got the power of God on them. Amen? Amen. And we, I want to tell you something. That has to be undergirded. And if you're a man that's filled with the Spirit of God, underneath him there's a burden and a love and a tenderness and a kindness toward people that they love people. There is. doesn't just mean you holler loud and shout. But there's a tenderness and a burden and a, and a love and a compassion for souls and for people. And I want to tell you what it will do to you. Make you want to see their families stay together. Their marriages stay together. Their children know the Lord. There's just so many things involved in that, and that's, that's just what I want for us. I'm, I'm messing this sermon up. I'm just, I don't know. But I'm talking about what's involved to be in the ministry. I'll be honest with you. The older I get, the dumber I am, and I was awful dumb to start with. I was over praying this evening, this honest truth. And I said, Lord, I'm beginning to understand. When you said, when you've done all, say I'm an unprofitable servant. Somebody calls me up and says, oh, Brother Reggie, I listened to a message and it helped me so much. I said, I hope I didn't do you more harm than I have good. We got a letter this week from an outfit. And they are giving CDs of this church to a uh, men's addiction home ministry. And now we're, they're, they're uh, having these men that are in this getting out of drugs and whatever stuff ministry there, you know. God's doing things out there, folks, through this church that we don't even have any idea. Now, I, I just thought, that's just so neat. Just wrote a little note, said, just want you to know we're taking your CDs into a men's addiction ministry, and these men are listening to the gospel, and we appreciate the CDs. So uh, I just want to encourage you. We're getting in this book of Timothy, and now when I move to the next segment of it, I was going to give you a warning. Now, I'm, I don't know when, I may continue preaching on prayer for two or three Sundays. Okay? But one of these days, how many knows what the next subject is after prayer in 1 Timothy? Chapter 2. It's women. Oh, I tell you, I like to preach on women. Amen? And it's dress and it's modesty. So if you don't want to hear it, don't come. Because I'm going to tell you right now, I'm not backing up. I'm, I'm not backing up. I'm going to preach the Bible, and I'm going, to, I'm going to preach Reggie, but I'm not backing up. I'm going to show you some stuff that you really, really need to hear about what's going on in our culture that's in defiance against the Word of God and one of, part of what's going on. But he covers so many things in this book. I mean, it's amazing. But uh, I'm, I'm going to just get something off my chest tonight. Man, we need men. Amen. Amen. See, I really don't like preaching on women. 
women are pretty nice people. My mama was a woman. My wife's a woman. My daughters are women. I think they're pretty nice people myself. But I'm going to tell you something. We need some men. I am so sick of this sissified manhood deal in America. It makes me want to vomit. Amen. Now I want to say I thank God for you men in this church. I wish I could grow a beard. Amen. I'd grow a beard if I could. I'm jealous of you, Brother Dennis. You and your brother over there act. You'll be better than the rest of us. you got better beards, you know. <laughs> I'm just teasing you. But I'm serious with you. We need men. See, this abortion deal has got me burned out, burned up. I'm just going to go ahead and say it. It's just 808. It won't take me very long. I'm going to say something to you tonight. How many people have ever read my book? Just, just by my hand. All right, a few of you have. That book opens up with the theme of heart that is in my entire being. And that is what that woman said to that class in the first chapter. All week long, you're hearing about this abortion debate. A woman this and a woman that and a woman this and a woman that and a woman this and a woman that and a woman this and a woman that. The woman's right and blah, 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 on it goes. Let me tell you why abortion is what it is in this country. It's not because of the women. It's because of men. That, that girl didn't get pregnant by herself, fellas. And the real problem is not... Yeah, I know women are sinners too. But how many times have you heard Christian people, even preachers, say, it's always about, oh, she had an abortion, a woman had an abortion, a woman had an abortion, and you never hear nothing about the guy. You know why? Because that's embedded in American culture that the guy can commit fornication, walk off like a dog. Nobody says nothing about him. He's just free to go play pool and, and run his car. But the girl is the one who's bearing the responsibility of it. Right. And nobody says nothing about all the guys across the country who are the fathers of all the, we talk about millions of aborted babies. Every one of them has a father somewhere yeah. who walked off. Yeah. And I want to tell you boys something. You get a girl pregnant, and you walk away, you're sorry, you're a scumbag lowlife. First of all, don't do it. And you say, how do you not do that? Don't touch her till you're married. I ain't ne never been no girl got pregnant yet till the guy didn't touch her. <laughs> Amen. It makes me sick in this country that our culture, it's all on the women. Yeah. You know, you know why? Because men quit being men in this country. We're so deteriorated spiritually, we won't take responsibility for our sin and for our responsibility of children. And it is so embedded in our culture. It's in our culture. Not, not Pittsburgh and not Kansas City. It's right here. That boys grow up with the deal of, well, you know, I can go get a girl pregnant. It's no, she get an abortion. I'm, I'm, it's no big deal off my back. Yes, it is. You're going to give an account of Almighty God at judgment about that. Amen. And I'm telling you right now, for one preacher, I think the boys, the men, are more responsible than the women. You walk off. You don't have to walk in that abortion clinic. You don't have to deal with it. It's all over the news everywhere. It's the girl, the girl, the woman, the woman, the woman, and the baby, and the baby, and the woman, and the baby. Where's the guys? America, where are the men? When are we going to start holding boys accountable, men accountable for conceiving a child that was slaughtered? And I'm sick. I'm tired of it. And I will say in this church right here, the, here's the deal. God put the emphasis of spiritual leadership on men, not women. And we say on one hand, we want women to be everything the Bible says they're supposed to be, while we want to be dogs on our side. I'm going to tell you what, it, it's got me wound up, I'm telling you. Now, just be honest with you, in all my growing up, I'll tell you, they don't tell me how thousands of messages I heard, and I never heard one time about boys, you, you know, it's all about girls, all about the girls, all about the girls, all about the girls. I'm sick of it. Yeah, I know they've got responsibility, and I know they shouldn't. But I'm going to tell you the honest truth about it is, a girl is designed 
to desire a man to love her and cherish her and care about her. And some jerk that walks up and just fools her and he takes advantage of that heart that she wants to be loved by somebody. Amen. And then he uses her. And, take, and by the way, girls, I'll tell you, a guy does that, he's treating you like trash. Right. He's just, treat, he just treating you like cash. Just drink the contents and throw it in the, in the trash ditch. And I think it's high time that in the churches of America that we men stand up and say, you know what? We're going to quit, we're going to quit blaming a girl because she didn't get pregnant of her own. Some dog messed with her. Probably her emotions. Now, I realize girls are sinners. Don't give me that. I understand all about that. But if the boys would be what they ought to be, there wouldn't be much of the other. Amen? Amen. So in this church, in this ministry, we're going to put the emphasis where it really needs to be. And what's bothering me about it, I'm, I'm telling you right now, I grew up, I was a teenage boy. Don't, what, the, the whole concept I had of me being a man was, if I had me a good car, sharp car, and how many girls I could be with, and how, how many deer I could kill. I was about manhood. And it had nothing to do with manhood. Man. I tell you what it has to do with manhood. If you can control your body, you might be a man. I'm going to give you boy something. You got about enough blood to run your body or your brain, but not both. Let's well get it out right now. If we're going to claim to be a Christian church and a Bible-believing church, we need boys that will do right with girls. If we're not going to teach that and not going to believe that, then there's nothing to. Because that's one of the biggest cultural things we're dealing with right now. We're, when we're squalled about abortion, abortion, abortion. I hope the Supreme Court does this. I hope the Supreme Court. What about us men doing right? Did you know that if all the men in America are doing right, the Supreme Court wouldn't even be here in the case? And you can listen to the news to your ear bends crazy. And you can listen to preaching in churches and ministries and abortion ministries to your ear. And it's all about what we're going to do with these women. We're going to provide a, provide a place for these women. We're going to provide a ministry to these women. And nobody says, shh, nothing about the boys who are out there. They went on with their work and their job and they went on to another woman. Nobody says nothing to them. You know what we've said to the boys? It's fine. It's just, we, we don't, it's quite unspoken cultural acceptance in America for you to be a whoremonger. For you to conceive children and then watch them kill them. I'm going to tell you right now, it's not going to be the women so much as it is the boys at judgment. You watch what I tell you, the men. I, I, I've, I've ranted my rant. Let's stay and go home. I will tell you something right now tonight. There ought to be 30 boys in this building tonight. Make a vow to all God and God, by his grace, you're not going to father an illegitimate child. How about that? I will not be part of a conception of a child out of wedlock. I will not be part of conceiving a child that conceivably could be taken to an abortion clinic. Where, where was the boy? Where, where was the daddy, the father that could conceive that child when she walked in that abortion clinic and when they took those instruments and when they slaughtered that baby and butchered that baby, where was that daddy? Where was that daddy when she's in the, uh, the post-operating room weeping and crying because she's killed her own, ch her own children? Where were they when she said, I don't know what I'm going to do with this child. I don't have the money to raise it. I don't know what I'm going to do. I'm in a helpless situation. Where was the boy at? I'm tired of it. And I want to be honest with you. Yes. I am part of that culture. And I'll probably never live long enough to totally conquer it. But it's sick. It's demonic and out of hell. And I'll tell you what let's do in this church. Let's raise some boys who will be men. I just, I'll just be honest with you. This is one of them, this is a core, deep, deep core of my, my whole being. If I had, if there's one thing I could do in this country, if I could preach to America for one message, you know what it would be? It would be this message right here. Until we have a revival of manhood, nothing else is going to happen. Father in heaven, I tell you, Lord, had a hard time preaching this evening. 
but it's okay. I pray, Lord, that I've not said nothing that I shouldn't have said. I pray that I've used some horse sense tonight. I pray, God, that you'll help people that may serve the Lord in one capacity or another. To know, Lord, that it's about souls, it's about the Savior, but there's going to be sword, it's going to be wise as serpents, harmless as dove, going to be sheep among the wolves. God, there's a lot of things involved in it. And Lord, I pray that you'll give men grace, and I pray, Lord, that you'll fill them with your spirit, that they'll not be content, Lord, till they've wrestled all night with, like Jacob did, until you change their name. God, I pray that they'll say, Lord, I'm not going to let you go till you bless me. And Lord, I pray that you help this church. Lord, I, I, I don't know. I seem like, Lord, I'm just troubled tonight. I'm, I'm having a hard time, God. But I tell you, Lord, we need your help. And God, I pray for the young men of this church, that there'll be young men of virtue and, and uh, moral strength. God, help us to change the tide of this nation. Lord, 80% of children in these inner cities, God, don't know who their dad is. Lord, it's a stinking shame. It's going to destroy our culture. It's going to destroy our civilization. God, it gives the government more power over our lives. God, tonight I pray for these young men in our church that, Lord, the sweet spirit of God would give them grace to really know what it is to love a young lady enough to be morally pure with her. God help the young ladies to be wise, to be alert, to be discerned. God, I also pray that you'll give them hearts to be married and be attracted to each other. And Lord, to experience romance and the good things that goes with it. Lord, the excitement and the thrill of, of uh, courtship and marriage. God, I pray, give them a wonderful time, but Lord, keep it in the bounds of your holy word. We ask you, Lord, in Jesus' name, help us to be men. Amen. Brother Jim be preaching Wednesday night. Brother Sutton, it's sure good to see all you and your family. Glad to see you kids. I tell you, I, I miss you whether you think I do or not. I'm not apologizing for my preaching. It just seemed like I had a hard time tonight, okay? Is Brother Paul Wade all right? Does anybody know?